Okay, so um, last class we spoke about Socrates. We spoke about uh, the apology and uh, the allegory of the cave. So Socrates is basically uh, giving us an idea of what it's like to be a good critical thinker. And that part of wisdom consists of uh, admitting uh, and seeking out the holes in our own, uh, in our own system of beliefs. Um, and also sort of this consideration of what are the limits of um, human knowledge? Uh, what are the ways in which we get sort of trapped in our own ignorance? And so let's talk about rhetoric. Rhetoric, um, this is how Aristotle defines it. Aristotle uh, wrote a book on rhetoric a long time ago. And rhetoric is basically the study of persuasion. And so it's something very interesting to consider. And uh, it's, it's a good start, sort of starting point as we get into sort of this analysis of uh, pseudosciences and conspiracy theories. Um, what makes a claim believable? Uh, what are the factors in persuasion? What do we mean by persuasion? Okay. Basically, uh, how does somebody get their idea into your head or vice versa? What are the contributing elements? Uh, so Aristotle defines rhetoric as the study of persuasion, uh, the faculty of observing in any given case, the available means of persuasion. So what are um, the factors uh, that contribute, that augment the likelihood that uh, persuasion will take place, that uh, you, you can get your idea, whether it's a legitimate idea, whether it's a truthful idea or not, uh, whether this transference of idea from one mind to another is going to occur, okay? Now, this is, uh, there's a few things I want to say here. I think this is very interesting, but uh, this can be used uh, both in a sort of a beneficial way, but it can also be used um, in a very sort of malicious way, quite obviously. If we're only using, if we're, if we're seeking to persuade somebody uh, knowingly, uh, knowing that what we are telling them or what we are trying to sell them is a bunch of nonsense, uh, then it can be used very maliciously. Again, some people are very good at exploiting these means of persuasion for malicious means. So that's why we know, sort of need to study them. We need to study them so that we're, we're able to use them in a beneficial way, but also to sort of in a kind of a defensive manner so that we're able to detect uh, when somebody's sort of using all these, uh, the, the, the tricks to make something appear other than it is. So Aristotle talks about rhetoric as it's the full package, okay? everything that is involved in uh, persuasion. When we talk about uh, rhetoric nowadays, what we're really talking about is um, Oh, the whole spec the, the spectacle. In other words, nowadays, when people normally talk about rhetoric, they make a sort of a distinction between uh, the actual meaningful content versus how that content is presented. And they call the sort of uh, the superficial aspect, the presentation aspect, the rhetorical aspect. Okay. So I'm going to sort of uh, switch between the two of those. Um, but even if we don't sort of clearly de uh, delineate between sort of Aristotle's definition uh, and this other definition, it's fine. So they're basically, according to Aristotle, let's get into it. And what I'm trying to say now is gonna become clearer. It's a little bit abstract. But for, uh, for Aristotle, there are really three elements in persuasion. And this is something that I may want you to retain. This sort of uh, this triangle of persuasion. There are three, uh, there are th there's always sort of three players. Um, what he calls ethos, pathos, and logos. So basically, let me start with logos. This is the most important one for us. What is the message being conveyed? What is the message being conveyed? Um, how is it being conveyed? How is it, how is it, how is it, how is it? Here. So guys, make sure that uh, you guys know how Zoom works. Just make sure that you're muted. Um, otherwise, we're going to hear your background conversation or we're going to get this resonance. All right. So what primarily concerns us is logos. What is the, what is the message uh, that is intended to be conveyed. This, I, I'm gonna give it to you a little bit abstract and then I'll give you some concrete examples. Uh, then ethos is who is the person that is conveying the message? In other words, the speaker, uh, or it might be, let's say, the person that's trying to sell you something or the politician that is trying to you know, the, the deliver his message. Um, so the message is logos. Uh, ethos is who is the person, what, what aspects about the person who is actually delivering the message? may make persuasion more likely to occur. And pathos is uh, the receiver of the message or the audience. Was it, what is it about the audience, uh, their psychology, that may make persuasion more likely to occur? 
Okay, so the, uh, what should we need to look at? For instance, in logos, we need to look at, is the message clear? Is it logical? Is it, uh, does it seem uh, to be based on truth, reality, evidence? Uh, is it being presented with uh, clear statistics? Is it being presented in a coherent manner? Those are all some preliminary considerations for what is it about the, the claim that is being conveyed? Uh, ethos is what is it about the person who is making the claim? which may augment or diminish uh, you know, persuasion or confidence. Uh, so things like your assessment of this person's knowledge, uh, how this person presents himself, uh, his confidence, uh, how you assess his expertise and so on. Still a few people coming in here. Uh, and pathos is what is it about, as I said, uh, you as an audience that can also be sort of targeted and in some sense, potentially used against you. So what is it about the psychology of the person who's receiving the message? Uh, their desires, their aspirations, their expectations, their fears, their anxieties, their wants, and so on. So let me just try to give you a, a very simple example, and then I'll try to give you better examples as we go along here. But suppose um, you're dealing with a car salesman, okay? Um, so you have basically the car that is being sold, the person who is selling the car, and you who is they're buying the car. So if the car salesman is going to give you a sales pitch based on logos, you basically say, well, why should I buy this car? And he's going to say, well, this is how much it's going to cost you. This is uh, the average mileage. Uh, this is how well it's rated in these reputable magazines. Uh, this is the highway safety rating. He's going to basically give you uh, the facts. Uh, so logos would be like information and how uh, the information fits together, how meaningful it is and consistent it is. Uh, if you ask the, the car salesman, you know, well, why, why should I buy this car? He may use sort of an ethos, more of a sort of an ethos approach. Um, and these are not exclusive. It can be a combination of all of these. So if, if he's taking an ethos approach, he's going to sound something like, uh, just listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. Nobody sells more cars than me. Uh, in this dealership. I've been doing this for 25 years. I know all of these cars. I've driven all of these cars. I know them inside out, okay? And all my customers are happy. So it's really an appeal to, um, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. That's, that's sort of the ethos. And however up, however that's built up, it can be uh, verbal, it could be nonverbal, it can be how they present themselves and so on, okay? Uh, so rhetoric is really the full package. It's not only necessarily linguistic, and pathos would be, you know, well, why should I buy this car? You're going to buy this car because trust me, when I was your age, I had a car exactly like this and I loved it. You're going to put the convertible down. You're going to put the music up. Uh, it's going to fit right into your budget. Trust me, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. So basically telling you a story that is sort of, uh, that fits in. If the, if the seller is able to tell a story, uh, is able to tell you the story that you want to hear, you're go he's going to augment the likelihood of the sale. So th this can also be sort of, um, we also get rhetoric in marketing, how products are marketed. Usually products are not marketed uh, using sort of appeal to reason, appeal to uh, the intellect, appeal to statistics. A lot of products, as you can tell, especially let's say TV commercials and so on, um, are uh, presented basically by appeal to emotion appeal to desires, okay, appeal to uh, your fantasies, and so on, um, and also sort of products, and, and this is, this is um, let me make this next point, why do we need to study this, well, we need to study this because these are, these are good tools if we want to be effective communicators, but uh, as I said, we also need to be aware of them because they can be, uh, we can be taken in by them, okay, these are very, very powerful tools. And in some sense, it's re regrettable. And I'll give you some examples to articulate this. It's regrettable that we are as susceptible to rhetoric as we are. Uh, that these things can be uh, used to basically uh, make, us, uh, make us believe things and buy things and do all kinds of things that might not even be in our best interest. Um, so we need to separate out the content versus how that content is presented. We need to be able to filter uh, the idea and the merits of that idea uh, versus how that idea is presented and articulated. Uh, in other words, all the superficial stuff that is not really useful 
in getting at the idea and establishing the legitimacy of the idea, but it's nonetheless there. And so, so we need to, be, to, to put it very simply, and I'll give you sort of a sort of a product placement example. We need to distinguish between. Um, hold on, let me see. Here. We need to you need to distinguish between the 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 product versus the packaging. You need to distinguish between the content versus how that content is is presented. So guys, don't worry. As I said, uh, these notes will be provided. Everything is going to be provided uh, in Leia in the document section. So don't worry about it. Just kind of pay attention. Uh, write down, if you are taking notes, write down some key definitions, uh, some examples that make sense to you. But also, if you consider products, uh, and we've all had this experience where you, you, you see a product on a show, you know, there'll oh, be sort of the more, the less expensive product. And usually, as a, another student in another class said, the less expensive product will usually not be at eye level. It'll usually be somewhere else on the shelf. Uh, and the more expensive product will usually have a sort of a, a more favorable place on the shelf. It'll be sort of conveniently at eye level. And therefore, you'll have sort of a first exposure to it. And you'll be more likely to buy it. Yeah, go ahead. Orlando, you have a hand up. Go ahead. Sir, are you supposed to be showing us notes? Because I still see the, the, the Outlook Microsoft thing. OK, hold on. Let's see here. Um, Thank you for letting me know. Let me see if I can. Uh, let's try this again. OK, so let me get back into it here. Share screen. Let's try this. OK, you guys see the uh, presentation now? Rhetoric with the pipe in the background? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah, yeah we see it, sir. Yeah, that's no, good. All right, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. So um, for instance, with, uh, with regards to, let's say, pro uh, product placement, we've all had the experience where you buy an expensive product uh, and it ends up being a piece of garbage, it ends up being a piece of shit, okay? And it's sort of very frustrating. And then you realize, okay, well, why? Because I got basically sucked into uh, either this idea that because something is more expensive, it must be better. That's sometimes true. And we would hope that, you know, uh, that's generally true as a correlation, but it's not necessarily true, okay? That uh, sometimes you buy something and it ends up being an inferior product. Uh, so that's part of the sort of the fallacy, or we end up uh, believing that because something is popular, it has a sort of a regard as a well-established brand. Therefore, it must also be good. And we end up sort of being uh, deceived. And that can also be used against us. Uh, or you see sort of a, a product on the shelf and it, it's next to a product that's pretty pretty simple, pretty sort of bland. And this product is sort of packaged, you know, it's plastic upon plastic upon plastic. A lot of, uh, it's a big show, it's a big spectacle, okay? Uh, and then you buy it and you open up the packaging and you finally get around to the product and you realize it's a piece of junk. Uh, so we've all had that experience. And that is in some sense, a form of sort of visual rhetoric. Um, it's sort of an appeal to, you know, uh, brand, and appealing to this idea that because it's more expensive or because it's more well-packaged, because it's more flashy, it's gonna be better. And we've all had uh, some disappointment with that. Uh, what else did I wanna say with regards to that? So we need to sort of make that distinction, all right? Um, can we think of some products that, that do that, okay? Yeah, we, we know that sort of brands do that. Uh, they have that sort of appeal. It's a sort of uh, authority, you would call it sort of maybe ethos. Uh, or they use sort of keywords that will sort of resonate with what, what you want, what you desire, you know, what you, this sort of uh, false promises of what this thing is going to give you. Uh, and that would be sort of uh, the marketing appeal to pathos. Uh, does anybody else have an example of that, of like a, a product that does that well, uh, that a product that has that certain authority and it just sort of rides that authority? A lot of brands do that. A lot of very good brands actually start out uh, having, let's say, uh, okay, the, the, the point that I was going to make just came back to me, so I'll make it in a second. But a lot of uh, very good brands start off by doing that. Not only do they have sort of very good branding, they have very good image, but there's also sort of quality there. But once they've established the brand and people can recognize the brand, then they can start diminishing quality um, and keep up their sales because people are sort of, uh, have now identified that brand with quality and they sort of give that company or that brand sort of carte blanche. It's sort of like as Socrates says, you then end up, uh, are you, 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 you then end up only judging it by its label. And even though the quality is gradually diminishing over time, uh, you, you, you fail to see it. 
So you can we can be you can be straight up blinded by rhetoric. Uh, what I mean to say is, you may uh, you may buy an ex like the example I was using. You may buy an expensive product and then come home and unpackage it and be very disappointed. So, you know, uh, you know, I got screwed because I I was basically uh, suckered into buying this flashy thing, which is a piece of junk. And you're at least able to detect that you've been deceived. There are a lot of people that will buy some expensive. And even though it is inferior quality, they are so blinded by the idea that, for instance, it, it is expensive, therefore it must be good, or it is flashy, therefore it must be good, that they're not even, even at that point, they're so blinded by the rhetoric that they cannot even admit to themselves that they've been deceived, okay? Uh, so you guess you, you have to sort of console yourself. Uh, no, but that, consoling yourself would mean that you, 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 would ex you have accepted that you bought a piece of shit product. But uh, a lot of people will simply believe that the product is good, even when there is overt evidence to suggest that uh, it is an inferior product, uh, simply because th the rhetoric has uh, overpowered the, their, their, their basic beliefs about that idea or about that theory or about that claim or about a particular uh, you know, political candidate or about a product or about a brand. Um, that they're completely suckered in. In other words, they're they're basically like it's like a, at the level of a cult. Uh, you know, the brand can give them an absolute piece of garbage, but because it has the right branding, they're sort of all in and they stand by it. Okay, uh, and they they won't listen to any contrary evidence to suggest that uh, they've basically been suckered into nonsense. Yeah. And it happens, like, as, as I said, it happens at all levels. It might be a car salesman. It might be a politician. It might be, uh, you know, an ad that you come across on YouTube or on television. It might be how a product is placed on a shelf and how it's uh, packaged and so on and so on. Um, you know, you also see that, for instance, there are some products in grocery stores that will have their sort of their, their, their own personal display, you know, the sort of thematic display, which then catch, it catches your eye. It stands out from all the rest. And that's all part of you know the, the spectacle, the, the the attempt to persuade you to uh, to accept, to purchase, to vote for this candidate, and so you get the point. Okay, uh, let's proceed here. If this PowerPoint is not gonna jam on me here, any questions or comments, concerns at this point? This always happens. Let me see here. Okay, uh, so as I said, we need to sort of uh, study these things because uh, we we are. Uh, Regrettably, we are not always rational, even in terms of how we make purchases. We make purchases uh, sporadically, impulsively, uh, emotionally, based on our desires. Uh, and so we are susceptible to rhetoric. So therefore, we need to study it. Uh, and so I, I do want you to retain, as I said, this sort of triangle, these three elements. And I'll give you a specific example of um, one sort of linguistic way in which this is done. Uh, so we need to distinguish the logical strength of an argument from the psychological persuasiveness of how that argument is presented. There you go. The content, the, what is this person saying fundamentally? What is the claim of their theory? And what are they offering as evidence or as support for this claim? What is truly, uh, what is truly central to what they're saying? And what matters in all of the... You know, in all of the noise that they're making, are they actually presenting any data that connects meaningfully to their central idea? The rest is just sort of spectacle. Okay, we need to distinguish the logical strength of an argument from the psychological persuasiveness of how that argument is presented. Uh, so the content from the packaging. Um, and now we're not dealing with products on shelves, or salesmen, or politicians. We're dealing with ideas. How is the idea being presented? What is being offered in support of that idea? And what is all the sort of superfluous stuff that is um, in conjunction with the idea, just sort of the, the presentation aspect. And why we need to do this, as I said, because we, we are triggered by certain words, by certain phrases that trigger us emotionally, that call upon certain you know, memories or whatever it may be. Um, so what you need to do is uh, somebody can persuade you through really any level. If somebody is very good at appeal to pathos uh, and they're working the pathos hard, they, they, they will be able to persuade you. Uh, if somebody is working just ethos 
uh, and they're working that element and only that element, that may be sufficient to persuade you. If somebody is using logos, that may be pers persuasive to persuade you, or they may be using any combination of all three, okay? Um, for instance, if uh, a lot of people are susceptible to, like, let's say, you know, when people get a phone call saying that uh, they have a, a relative in Nigeria that died and left them millions of dollars, you know, some African prince that died was a distant relative and left you millions of dollars that's sort of pathos they're telling you what you want to hear or that you just you know you just want a contest or that you know the border agency is looking for you or that the sea uh, you know canadian revenue agency is looking for you and they're going to put you in jail unless you uh, answer some questions about your identity uh, that's pathos they're either appealing to you, your your desires your fantasies that you've won some kind of magical prize or they're also, that's also pathos in that they're appealing to your fears and your anxieties. I don't want to get in trouble. So sure, you know, I'll, I'll identify myself. I'll give you my social insurance number and so on. That's purely pathos. They don't have to establish, well, they do sort of, they are relying on the sort of authority of, you know, the, C, the CRA, stuff like that. So it's maybe a little bit of ethos, but it's mostly pathos. For, for pathos, you know, for, I mean, for ethos. Somebody can say, and this is why I say we are as susceptible, uh, it's regrettable that we are as susceptible to this as we are. Because if somebody says, for instance, trust me, believe in me, I know what I'm talking about. I've done this for a long time. I'm an expert. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking about. Trust me, 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 trust me. At one point, in some weird sense, you just end up trusting them, okay? So we need to be careful for that. Let's say con artists, cult leaders, they're, they're expert at this. They understand uh, that, that aspect of human psychology and they're able to sort of play into it. Okay? They're able to kind of shape shift to, to, to be the person that you think, that it, 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 they, they're able to read inside of you the person that you would like them to be. And they're able to sort of uh, mimic that. Um, so what we're primarily concerned in is, is the, the logos. We really want good logos, okay? We want really to be looking at that. That should be our sort of primary indication of whether or not we should give something uh, credibility. Uh, we should give some, something our confidence or someone our confidence. It's primary logos, primarily logos. Now, why do I say that? Um, because that's where, that's where the juice is, okay? That's where the information is. Uh, that's where if there's going to be any uh, supporting evidence, if there are going to be any premises, uh, that's where it's going to be found. So that's where, uh, if somebody is giving, is trying to persuade you through pathos and ethos without any logos, that should ring some alarm bells. It should, it doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're necessarily trying to deceive you, but you should increase your level of skepticism. If somebody is trying to persuade you with pathos alone, forget about logos, but not even ethos, but just pathos alone, then you should, or even just ethos for that matter. Uh, for just that alone, ethos or and or pathos alone, you should increase your level of skepticism even a little bit further. But now it, get, it gets complicated because uh, this is kind of a, a separate point, but I think it's an important point. You can you can you can you can talk logos, but it might all be bullshit. You can talk about uh, studies and statistics and research. But it all might just be, you know, you're just making it up as you go along. So that you also have to be careful for that. Let me give you an example. You, know, you might have, let's say, a pseudoscientist that might say, oh, you know, uh, oregano oil in one study uh, cured 95% of people, uh, uh, you know, cured the cancer of 95% of people. In another study, oregano oil cured the cancer of 97% of people. In another study, uh, oregano oil cured the cancer of 99% of people. And it, it may sound very smart. It may sound very scientific. It may have, uh, the presentation may have a lot of scientific sounding jargon. They may have a lot of numbers, a lot of sort of quantitative looking stuff, a lot of charts, you know, a lot of graphs. But upon closer examination, you might discover that there are no such studies, that it's just, he's just making it up as he, he goes along, okay? That's a little bit, um, I don't wanna say that's rare, but most people, when they, they lie to you, a lot of first of all, a lot of a lot of con artists uh, think that they're smarter than they actually are. So even though they think that you're deceiving them quite well, they usually leave a sort of trail of clues that uh, there there are some inconsistencies and some lies there. Uh, some con artists 
you know, some liars for whatever reason, you know, they're trying to sell products or they're trying to get you to sign up to some, you know, uh, workshop or seminar. They, they may come up with all these sort of graphs and stuff like that. Um, but even there, if you look closely, it, it's, but that, that's very tricky because a lot of people will sort of be, well, you know, he's talking quantitatively. He's talking, he's citing all kinds of research. But if you were to take the time to actually just follow up with one of his sources, you realize the source doesn't exist. You know, he's quoting this university, the university that might not exist. So we have to be scare careful. I don't want you to, to get the impression that, uh, oh my God, everybody's lying to me and there's so many ways that they can deceive me. And, uh, you know, my whole life is a lie. No, it, it, but, but I want you to appreciate the potential of that. Okay, but let me see. There's one more point that I want to make. So we have to consider all three of these. Uh, let me see here. Uh, let me make one more point and then, Give, maybe give you one more example of how those things sort of interrelate. Rhetoric is not that is not inherently bad. Let me give you sort of three examples, three different presenters, so to speak. Suppose the first presenter is, let's say, giving a TED talk. He has good logos. Um, he actually is genuine. He actually is. Uh, he he regards himself as uh, a, a, a sincere authority, and he is. Suppose that he is. Okay, he's got really good research, so he's got good logos. And he wants to present that research because it's meaningful. Why not also add a little bit of pathos and ethos to the presentation to give it a little bit more, to make it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more exciting. You want, you care about your message. So you want it to be conveyed in a way that people will sort of absorb it. They will, can connect to it. They can relate to it. So, you know, you, 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 I often seen very good uh, lectures by people who know what they're talking about. And they may start off with sort of a little bit of ethos. They talk about themselves, you know, they establish their authority. They talk about why they study what, what they study. So that's good. There's a little bit of ethos there, but it's, it's, it's warranted. It's legitimate. It's not overdone. There might be a little bit of pathos too. You know, they connect to the audience. They relate it back to the audience. Um, and that's okay because they care about their logos. And so they're going to package it in a way that makes it sort of more uh, desirable to listen to. So that's kind of one type of person. And that's good. That would be sort of the good use of rhetoric, uh, kind of a noble use of rhetoric. Let me give you another type. There are some intellectuals who have amazing logos. They have amazing information, okay? But they're kind of dull presenters, okay? I'm, I'm, and maybe some of you have, uh, you know, teachers that are like this. I've had teachers like this. Like, this guy is smart and I'm really interested to know what he's talking about. It's hard, but it's hard to listen to him because he's boring, he's monotone, all right? And so there are, there are intellectuals, there are geniuses like that, okay? That I know some like, you know, they're like uh, some logicians and some mathematicians that are like that, that they're, they have amazing logos. It's, it, it's, it's, it's amazing, but they're, they have no social skills. They're basically antisocial. So there's, 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 it's very, you gotta, you gotta be really confident in their logos because it's hard to listen to them. Okay, but it's worth listening to them. You're worth, it, you, you, you nonetheless uh, are interested in listening to them because you say the logos is there. Now, the problem is, this is the problem. The problem is that these people that actually know a lot uh, don't really have much of an audience because they don't have that sort of appeal. They don't really appeal to uh, many people outside of the people that are, 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 are understand fundamentally. They get the logos and they understand what, the, what this person's talking about is genius. Now, on the flip side of that, you have a lot of people that have no logos whatsoever, but they're very good at ethos and pathos. And that's where you get the, the sort of anti-genius. The person actually doesn't know anything at all, but is able to put on the facade of knowing. And that's where you get sort of, you know, uh, shady sort of salesmen and uh, con artists and a bunch of people, you know. And there are regrettably more of those people than they are, or uh, let me try to put it this way those people actually actually get more of a platform and more of a following than the actual geniuses that know that what they're talking about who are not interested in having a following at all because they're just so focused on their field. Uh, these people actually do get quite a following, okay? Uh, all kinds of people, you know, you see them on YouTube, you know, promising that, oh, if you follow my seminar and you buy my book, you know, 12 step program, I'm gonna make you a millionaire. You know, you're gonna be making $5,000 a day working from home. Those people have a lot of, uh, regrettably, a lot of followers, okay? And ends up being kind of like a little cult. Precisely because, because these people, they know how to get those followers. That's precisely where most of their energy is, is seeking out 
the acquisition of more followers because that's where they make their money. This person is not interested in followers. Okay. It's like uh, the truth, you know, they're just interested in the truth. And if people are interested in the truth, then good for them, but they're not really interested in sort of selling it. They're not, they have nothing to sell. So you see where the problem lies. Uh, and you see where sort of rhetoric can be an impediment, an, an impediment, where it can be useful and where it can be malicious. Okay, hopefully that makes any comments, any questions. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Let me see what time we got here. All right, doing pretty good. Um, so again, it's always a sort of interplay of these. Um, you see, like politicians usually like to play this card. They like to play ethos and pathos, and they use they like to play sort of this anti ethos game. You know, I'm the I have the good ethos, and my opponent has sort of the bad ethos. So it's basically character bashing, and uh, you know, uh, blaming, and uh, you know, throwing around insults while trying to establish my own credibility. Not really talking too much about numbers or statistics. Um, but we should be sort of requiring this. We should be, uh, you should always be probing this element. Uh, and pathos, obviously politicians do this. I don't wanna to talk too much about Trump, but I, I guess uh, I have some examples like in my head is that basically how Trump won uh, his, the, the, the election. Well, he had some assistance in terms of, you know, Cambridge Analytica and, uh, you know, online propaganda tools and all that stuff. But he was very, very good at understanding his audience uh, that he can basically tell them whatever they wanted to believe. And if, if it was non-factual, basically, you know, uh, xenophobia, we have to be afraid of uh, people that come from other countries because they might be dangerous, they might be terrorists, or we have to be afraid of uh, immigrants because they're coming, they're going to take your jobs, they're going to take your jobs. And so it, basically really understanding something uh, simple and fundamental about uh, the people that he was uh, sort of pandering to. And also a lot of ethos. You know, I remember one interview where he said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to build a wall and I'm going to get Mexico to Mexico to pay for it. And the interviewer was asking him sort of for logos, kind of trying to draw it back into logos. Yeah, but how are you going to build the wall? Explain to us sort of mechanically what, what are the how are you going? How are you going to proceed to build this wall? Trust me, I just will. I'm going to get them to pay for it. Yeah, but how? How are you going to finance it? How is it going to be done? What are the you know, what are the logistics behind building the wall? Trust me, I know what I'm doing. They're gonna, I'm gonna build a wall and I'm gonna get them to pay for it. But how? Trust me, how? Trust me, okay? Going from, you're asking for logos and he's just reinforcing ethos because he really has no logos. There really is no plan, yeah? There really is no, uh, so, so it just basically, you know, you fill it in with uh, what you're good at as a con artist with, with primarily ethos and pathos, okay? Um, Consider this example now, if, if uh, the screen is going to co cooperate. So let me just go straight to the example that I have in mind. Some of you are familiar with, some of you guys have been in a car and you've been on, you've been listening to the radio and you're familiar with those SAAQ commercials, okay? Société d'assurance automobile du Québec, uh, which is basically just a, high, it's a sort of a highway safety public advertisement. They're not trying to sell you anything. Okay, so what are the adverts? Some of you guys are, are familiar with some of these ads. So what are they basically, what are the ads about? They're about sort of, you know, don't drink and drive, don't text and drive, uh, don't, uh, you know, consume uh, marijuana products and drive. And how do they proceed? They don't, they don't proceed with logos. They don't say, this is a message from the SAAQ. Last year, 150, uh, you know, like 1,500 people either lost their lives or were injured as a result of drunk driving and 2000 people had their license revoked as a result of uh, drunk driving infractions. Uh, therefore, uh, do not drink and drive. Th there's no appeal to statistics or anything like that. Um, and there's not even really an appeal to logos. Appeal to, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, that's not, that, that would be an appeal to logos, which is precisely what they don't do. And they don't even really do an appeal to ethos. They don't say, uh, this is a message from the SAAQ we're working with uh, La Sûreté de Québec, you know, the provincial police to catch people that are going to be uh, drunk driving and speeding and we're setting up roadblocks. So uh, we're going to catch you. That would be sort of fear of authority. Okay. That would be sort of ethos. What they actually do is kind of uh, pathos. Okay. Uh, they, they, they sort of uh, do, they, they play out this little sort of uh, theatrical uh, tragedy where you'll have, let's say somebody at a bar and you hear them entering the bar and then they're sort of clinking with their friends and 
you hear them drink and clinking with their friends and then you hear them drink and clinking the glass with their friends and you hear them drink and then you hear you know the keys and the ignition starting up the uh, the, the engine and then uh, you hear her terrible car crash you know they have to sort of convey this to you over the radio and it's basically just sort of this fear okay don't do it because you're gonna you know you're gonna hurt yourself you're gonna lose your license uh, you, you, you might kill yourself and somebody else don't do it so it's an appeal to fear and why do they do that again they're not, they're not trying to sell you anything there are people uh, in the marketing department of the saaq and they sit down with different types of potential marketing strategies for their uh, co- their for their campaigns and they what do they opt for they opt for uh, sort of appeal to pathos why because they know it works because it does work you know advertisers that are selling you products do not appeal to your intellect you don't sell people coca-cola and you don't sell people beer with appeal to intellect you sell people coca-cola and beer and a bunch of other products you know you sell people smartphones and a bunch of gadgets not by appeal usually not by appeal to logic and evidence but by appeal to emotions desires and so on why because it works um in some sense it's very regrettable uh but in some sense it's what makes us human because for, let's get to articulate that point is if i give you if i say 50 percent of the american population that is to say you know 170 million people about are two weeks away from poverty that is very shocking but in putting it in sort of broad statistics, something is sort of lost there, okay? Um, it's sort of shocking, but who cares? It's just numbers. But if I sh- sort of show you a two-minute video of a single mother with two children working two jobs, struggling to make ends meet, who is two weeks away from ending up in poverty, in some sense, the message hits home. It, 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 you understand something uh, essential much more directly in the second case why? Because because we are emotional beings, okay, and that is in part partially a failing, but it's also partially what makes us human, okay. Um, any questions, comments, reactions to that? No. All right. So let's jump to the next thing here. This is what I want you to retain. Uh, there's there's going to be a sort of a, a few techniques here. We're talking about sort of linguistic techniques. How do we use language? How do we select certain words? When do we use certain phrases that we that we know are going to have a certain kind of punch? a certain kind of appeal, okay? Uh, And I'll give you a a few sort of techniques, uh, but the main one that I want you to retain is this, okay? Maybe some of you guys are familiar with this. This is uh, what we call euphemisms and diphemisms. Euphemisms and diphemisms are words or phrases that we deliberately use to make something sound better or worse, okay? Uh, So can we think of any? If you guys can think of any uh, words that are, they basically operate as synonyms. We're using a synonym, but we're specifically using a synonym that we know carries with it a more positive sounding, you know, sounds better or deliberately trying to make it sound worse. And we're using the positivity or the negativity sort of strategically. Yeah. If you guys have an, a, any examples, just kind of spit it out or uh, raise your hand. Can we think of um, what would be a euphemism? A euphemism is when we sound, make something sound better than it is. So a classic example would be, instead of selling a used car, if you call it a pre-owned car, it sounds better. You're likely to sell more pre-owned cars than used cars. They are basically the same thing, okay? And if you, certif- if you sell a certified pre-owned car, you're going to sell even more of them, okay? It's the same thing. You're just using words that sound a little bit better. Okay. And for some reason that has an appeal. Okay. Um, what would be anybody else got another euphemism? Another euphemism would be, would be for instance, uh, the classic one is, you know, sorry, your mother died. Instead of saying, sorry, your mother died, you know, sorry that uh, she has departed. Sorry that uh, she has passed away. Okay. Instead of uh, George Carlin, I don't want to, I'm not going to show it to you now. Some of the examples are a little bit scandalous. But I encourage you to, if this interests you, uh, George Carlin has a very, very, George Carlin is a, is a comedian. Hopefully some of you guys know him. Uh, he's a stand-up comedian. And he has a very good skit. It's about 10 minutes long. If you Google uh, or you put into YouTube, George Carlin euphemisms, it's about a 10-minute skit and it's fascinating, okay? He plows through like 100 euphemisms. And he makes a point too. He makes a point of saying that some of the euphemisms that we use are just kind of this strange alteration of language that takes place over time. 
Okay, we just want to make things sound softer, or so on. Um, but he says also, he also makes the point that sometimes th these words are used deliberately. They're sort of engineered as substitutes uh, by politicians, by you know the by the military, by corporations to make something sound really other than it is. So it's a it's sort of it's a deliberate attempt to use language to sort of alter your perception on things. Anybody else got a euphemism or a diphemism? A classic diphemism uh, that was used a lot by uh, shortly after the 9-11, uh, especially in the United States, was basically everybody who was an enemy of the United States, you know, a neutral term would have been sort of, a, you know, a belligerent or an enemy combatant, but anybody who was regarded as an enemy of the United States was basically called a terrorist. Terrorist has that sort of, uh, that negative connotation to it, okay? It creates a kind of a scary picture. So you're an enemy of ours? Well, we're going to label you as a terrorist. And that makes it sort of easier to kill you. Uh, it makes it easier to mobilize public support against you because you're a terrorist, okay? Uh, it's sort of, um, it, it's what we call spin, you know? Like, that's what rhetoric is. It's spinning. You're spinning something. You're putting a spin on something to characterize it uh, in a sort of a different light so that your audience receives it uh, in a certain way. Okay, any other euphemisms and diphemisms? Okay, um, you know, George Carlin says, you don't talk about uh, old people anymore. There's no such thing as old people anymore. We call, now, we call them now senior citizens, okay? It sounds a little bit more, sounds nicer. Uh, what else? You say, if you don't have a job, you say, well, I'm between jobs right now. That might be technically true, okay? There may be some sort of technical uh, difference in definition for some of these synonyms. But the point is, that's not why they're being used, okay? Or you say, you know what? Uh, I got fired. I got fired sounds rough. You know, I got laid off sounds a little bit like you, you're sort of undermining. It. It's more of a euphemism. I got laid off. I lost my job. I got laid off. Uh, there may, again, don't get me wrong. There may be some technical difference in, in the word, but it's how it's, how it's used. Any other examples? Uh, you know, instead of some, kind of calling somebody fat, you call them, you know, no, no, they're just sort of big boned. Um, what would be a euphemism for, let's say, a drug user? If you were, let's say, take this example. If, we, if you were a politician advocating for safe injection sites, uh, how, what word will you use to describe somebody who is a drug user? And, and on the flip side, if you were a politician who was um, more of sort of a cracking down on drugs and you were against opening a safe injection site, what word would you use for a drug user? Okay, If you were for the safe injection site, you should say, you know, we should, you would use the sort of language of sort of victimhood. Uh, uh, we need to support these people. We need to come together as a community to support people that have, you know, substance abuse issues, uh, people with dependencies. Um, really, it's basically, you're are trying to articulate, they articulate it's, it's really not their fault. If you are on the other side politically, uh, you're not going to use the language of victimhood. You're going to use the language of uh, responsibility. So you're going to say, you know, uh, these are people that are druggies and junkies, sounds heavier, okay? Same thing, let's say, on sort of a similar line, let's say prostitution. Prostit uh, a prostitute is a fairly neutral term, okay? But I'm not sure. I'm thinking like you can use the word prostitute, let's say, in academic uh, research. Uh, what would be a euphemism for a prostitute if you were, let's say, seeking as a politician to legalize prostitution? And what would be a diphemism for it? Uh, what is a way of speaking about it so it sounds better? And what is a way of seeking, speaking about it so it sounds uglier and worse? Uh, if you're for legalization of prostitution, you're going to talk about it in terms of, let's say, sex trade workers. Okay, that's good. It sounds like they're going to pay taxes uh, and so on. You know, it sounds like they're going to have, uh, you know, more safety and security. Sounds good. If you are against it, again, you're going to use, you know, uh, who are these, uh, you know, these hookers? Uh, why are we supporting hookers and 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 whores? Whores, you know, now we're starting to get very, very sort of heavy. Uh, good. Any other examples? Um, you know, George Collins says instead of calling it uh, the dump, uh, you know, he so, said, you know, uh, we broke up, or you know, we 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 decided to to be friends. We broke up. Oh, well, you know, he, uh, I, I she dumped me, or he dumped me. Sounds a little bit heavier. Uh, or you know, actually the dump. You know, say uh, I took all this junk to the dump. Or you know, uh, this uh, these houses are situated next to the dump. If you're a real estate agent, you don't say, "Oh yeah, yeah." Uh, regrettably, you know, um, the dump is next door. Uh, you're gonna say, uh, "Yeah, it was convenient because you live you live next to what we call in Quebec 
you live next to the eco sound so it's convenient it's actually not an inconvenience it's a, so it's kind of instead of calling it a dump especially if you have to sell real estate in the area you call it an eco sound you call it a, a landfill landfill sounds a little bit better than a dump okay any other examples of this yes this is generally the, the again if we were in class uh you know, a bunch of hands would have been going up, but now on Zoom, everybody's a little bit scared on Zoom. Everybody turns into a ghost. Fair enough. Uh, what are some classic euphemisms that the military uses? Um, you know, just just before the United States left uh, Afghanistan for the last last time, they decided to drop some bombs using some nice military drones, which the United States love, loves doing. And in one supposed strike, they killed, I believe, about 10 people. Uh, there was a targeted, they were targeting a supposed uh, planned suicide bomber. And uh, in that strike, they, of the 10 people, six of them were children. So what do you call the children in the language of military euphemisms to make it sound a little bit more acceptable? You call it basically, there, I guess there are two terms. One of them is casualties. These are the casualties of war, okay? Uh, casualties of war. Or uh, you talk about it in terms of collateral damage. Collateral, da collateral damage is what? Collateral damage is you conducted uh, you know, a military offensive, uh, you caused damage, and in causing damage, you've caused unintended damage to people and or property, collateral damage, okay? You killed innocent people, it's collateral damage. It was the unintended consequence of supposedly a necessary military uh, exercise. Um, okay, good. What other uh, euphemisms do they use? You know, the Navy SEALs, or you talk about, let's say, a sniper. A sniper does not uh, kill people. They neutralize their target. Neutralize the target. Okay. You, that means you're, either, you're shooting them. Okay? You're shooting them uh, probably here. That's where you're shooting them. Okay? So you're either killing them or incapacitating them. Neutralize. Uh, any other euphemisms? Which there could be sort of uh, an, an intent here. For instance, if you're calling the police because your neighbors are having a loud party, if you say to the police, uh, you know, it's getting late and uh, they're making a lot of noise, there's a party going on next door, uh, can you please uh, send somebody over? The police is going to go. The police dispatcher is going to communicate to the police that, okay, there's a party. The police is going to go, but they're not going to, they're going to take their time. Okay. They're not in a rush to go shut down a party. But if you tell the police dispatcher on the phone, I don't know what's going on. There's a lot of noise. It's very chaotic. Uh, I'm scared that something bad's happening. You know, we call it noise. Instead of music, you call it noise. Noise in this case would be a sort of a euphemism, a, a diphemism for music. Now the police, you're, you're deliberately, in this case, you're deliberately introducing ambiguity in your listener. And that ambiguity can potentially, from the perspective of the police, has to be taken seriously. And so they're going to rush over there a lot faster. So it's much more convenient for you to say, uh, there's a lot of noise coming from my neighbor's house and I don't know what's going on, okay? And just hang up the phone. Leave it as amb ambiguous as possible. They're going to get there a lot faster. If you say it's a party, they're going to get there, but they're going to take their time. Uh, and so, so, oh, there's euphemisms for, for everything, you know? If somebody's stupid, you say, you don't call them stupid. You say, well, you know, he's not the, the smartest tool. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. He's not the brightest bulb. Not the brightest bulb. You know, so these are kind of these are sort of euphemistic sort of phrases that are typical in in different languages. Little phrases, little expressions. You know, say, so, oh, he's a, he's not an alcoholic. He just enjoys a pint or two. Uh, he's not an alcoholic. He just enjoys a pint or two. So I, I don't know. Any other examples of this? No. So you get the point. Okay. So uh, and as George Carlin says, we need to be, sort of be mindful of this, the use of this, because. Um, how things are presented can basically change our expectation or our perspective. You know, you can say, uh, thanks to the thanks to the efforts of upper management, they managed to retain 50% of the workforce. Or you can th you can also say, from let's say the perspective of the union, uh, due to uh, negligence and uh, arrogance from upper management, 50% of the workforce has been fired. You're ultimately conveying the same thing. Um, but in some sense, you're not conveying the same thing because you are presenting that information in, in a completely different uh, way, all right? So there are a bunch of other uh, uh, rhetorical methods. You know, you can ridicule, exaggeration, um, you can distort, 
uh, what the person is saying. You can change the issue. There's also overlap with fallacies that we're going to uh, get to talk about. But this, this is basically the one that I want you to retain for now. Uh, any questions or comments with regards to this? <clears throat> 